think I would like to extend my gratitude to the Center for Kinoda Excellence for the initiative this very relevant and timely conference and also making, a part, making us a part of this important journey. I also extend a warm welcome to our event panelists in this session. This session focuses mainly on uh, wastewater management, zero ticket to start and sea water management. Uh, from the perspective of municipal bodies, this essentially entails effective collection and treatment of wastewater, uh, mainly focusing on you know, uh, you know, non treatment and non uh, use of non portable functions, you know, particularly industrial town power plants. From industry's point of view and power plants, the focus should be on you know, zero to no, I mean, should ensure 100% uh, reuse of you know uh, uh, waste water and this and also uh, that on-site treatment is there. You know, so that uh, is there. So I'll just start uh, the presentation. So to commence the session, I present an overview of the present state of water and wastewater in India, emphasizing the immediate need for effective management and you know recycling of treated wastewater for a multitude of applications. As a disclaimer to begin with, I would focus more on municipal and domestic waste water generation and treatment. So, India is counted as one of the water stressed uh, nations, and uh, the only major economy after China which is water stressed in this category. You know. So, the rest are broadly you know, not stressed, they are mildly stressed. So, our groundwater resources are overexploited and the surface is polluted. So, I think the situation is only set to worsen with the advent of climate change and severely impacting the ability of fresh water. So, though overall per capita production of water is a global phenomenon, in India it is more serious. As you can see, uh, we can almost uh, so a 23% decline over the next 25 years. That's a significant amount. And one, if we see that it's multiplied by you know, uh, population, I think that the, uh, the amount is uh, you know, staggering. So, if we continue with the current trajectory, I think we and expect a staggering loss of 6% of GDP, you know, because of the initiative water for our economy. So, as the economy grows, we are experiencing a shift in water use pattern and demand, the power sector industries are being the major drivers. We, uh, the research indicates that, you know, share of power exponentially increased almost eightfold uh, by 2050. Similarly, uh, industrial water demand is also double, double going to the same period from 2% to 4%. <coughs> Uh, what we say the domestic water use will remain stable. Uh, the margin will rise from 6.6 to 7.1 percent. Uh, we anticipate that although the coverage will increase, but uh, with you know uh, balance, I mean you know, in new technologies and introduction of non NRW non renewable water, I think uh, the the overall demand will be the the share will be uh, similar. And also for agriculture, we assume that with crop diversification. Crop diversification and an option of you know smart irrigation technologies. I think the the demand per unit would, would sort of you know decrease while maintaining this productivity. So this chart indicates only the share of uh, the water allocation, not the actual amount that that will increase uh, for each sector over for the next uh, 30 years. So the current status of Wastewater management is quite serious. Uh, it's, uh, one more to exclude the wastewater uh, produced by rural India, uh, for which I think government has taken a separate SDM Ramen uh, initiative you know, to manage at the decentralized level. The, the, the wastewater generated in urban area is stacking 70,000 MLD. So this figure is uh, you know, sort of alarming because right now only 33% of population is covered right now uh, with sewage connection. So if we uh, you know, sort of consider that amount of it will increase significantly the, 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 the waste water generated. So, government of India, I mean, many government, I mean, you know, state governments, and you know, there are a lot of initiatives to take in before sewage uh, and you know, and increase the waste. So, I think this figure will increase the amount of waste water generation. Uh, considering that the installed capacity is around 42 43 percent, roughly, you know, and uh, is around 32,000 energy. But if you consider the factors like operation capacity, utilization, compliance with CPC norms, you know, the, the, the gap, you know, really widens. You know? So, in fact, uh, it, it's only 16% uh, capacity, capacity from even generated waste is being treated. So, 
So that's a huge gap which is there currently if we talk about you know, STPs meeting the standards of uh, CPCB, you know, and treating uh, the waste product. So I think this provides us two situations. You know, one is that there's a huge investment opportunity in this sector. You know, I mean, staggering as per the uh, Niti Aayog estimates, it's around one that is around crores. So that is one. Second, also that there's a huge uh, you know, significant amount of waste water is you know can be tapped for for industries and some of the plant uses, which is not being utilized right now. So I think that's a for me that is more important. Sixty thousand MLD opportunities there, you know, uh, pan India, which can be sort of you know used for recycling for industrial purposes. So similarly for uh, reuse of treated waste water, I think currently around thirty percent uh, of that uh, waste water treated waste water is being reused. Uh, but that is primarily, I mean, by urban local bodies, that's primarily for horticulture and you know uh, road cleaning and you know building construction and sort of activities. You know, mainly those applications are being used. Um, very few case studies are there where you know it's actually being used for industries or or They they are they, they are successful cases, but very few. They are not a institutionalized sort of a success story. So similarly, uh, I think and all I think. As you can see from my, most of the states have a wastewater uh, policy, the reuse of wastewater policy, treated wastewater. But but the 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 provisions and the goals are very very widely, you know, the strategy and the goals, you know. So for example, Gujarat uh, has a target of you know achieving 100% by 2030, you know, of, uh, using 100% treated wastewater. Uh, and then Haryana has a target for 80 percent. 80 percent uh, of the treated wastewater will be reused for industrial and power plant applications by 2030. But given other states like Punjab, Tamil Nadu, they have a you know a little less stringent targets, and they suggest that you know that you can use for agriculture purpose also. So this is this approach is also I mean so there are two different approaches. You know, one is for industrial purpose, and second is for say uh, more lower end you know agriculture purpose. You know. It's easy to implement because of lower treatment requirements uh, for agriculture uh, you know, uses. So, so this is broadly the timeline, you know, uh, the brief overview of the evolution of improvement of regulations concerning this uh, sector treated wastewater. So while standards have been there for wastewater treatment for, for quite some time, uh, that 2012 national water policy catalyzed the use of treated wastewater as a strategy tool for water management. This policy was further revised to actively encourage these, uh, these practices in 2015. So, again, uh, the government, I mean, the governments and all, I mean, they are cognizant of this fact that, you know, that water is a, uh, is a, uh, you know, is a stressed resource right now. So, they, in 2021, they uh, launched, the government of India launched, uh, basically, NMCG and Nitya, they, they, uh, this framework for national national framework for reuse of treated wastewater. So, with the aim to reduce the dependence of fresh water uh, by advocating reuse of treated wastewater on a wider scale. So, what is different in this uh, in this framework was that it it has a comprehensive approach for all types of wastewater, uh, municipal, industrial, agriculture, aquaculture. You know, name. I mean, they they try to cover every you know waste water is there. You know, source of waste water. Also, it I mean that uh, it talks about the potential applications of that, you know, uh, how to treat and uh, this thing for different type of non potable uses, you know, like horticulture, municipal use, industrial applications, you know, so it has a detailed framework and also uh, one of the first, uh, this thing where it can, uh, treated wastewater can be used for uh, replenishing the groundwater supply, you know, aquifer management, so, so that is uh, what, uh, so, uh, so this this is I'll just uh, this thing in the past decade, the government of India has uh, sort of placed a huge impact, uh, you know, uh, impetus on water sustainability and allocating substantial sums of you know, uh, you know, budget for this uh, on a mission mode. You know, so they have lost multiple missions, the time bound, you know, focus and output. So, so Amrut two is one, you know, where it, you know, Amrut one was where they targeted only 500 top cities, class one cities, uh, with population of one lakh uh, and above. Uh, in second phase, they have targeted entire urban population. You know, all cities would be covered, uh, around 4,900 cities, uh, something like that, uh, around that. Um, where they will be covered with water supply and receive which 
So that is one of the, you know, uh, this, you know they also try to incentivize by, uh, you know, focusing on recycling of and reuse of tissue waste water uh, for city, for at a city level it should be 20 percent and at state level 40 percent of the industry demand should be met by reused uh, tissue water. So similarly, I think NMCG has made remarkable strides in uh, for River Ganga. You know, I mean, they have done the main artery. Now they are working upstream, you know, on the tributaries, uh, uh, you know, to to capture and treat. Similarly, the additional uh, progressive initiatives like Smart City, Infrastructure Management Commission, which are contributing to the infrastructure creation and management of the water and wastewater um, sector. One of the most notable in initiatives for targeting drinking water was Jaljun Mission. The project was to aim, you know, uh, provide 55 liters per capita per day to entire rural India, you know, for every this thing. And I think they have done a su substantially good job, you know, in terms of, you know, increasing Seventy percent now within four years. Uh, so while this initiative has a remarkable impact in terms of rural India, you know, the lives and it has touched a lot, but it doesn't come directly to our topic right now today because the wastewater generated would be more of a decentralized approach, you know, which is difficult to capture. It must be more of local treatment. So having established the need for treated wastewater, I think it is clear that this could simply contribute to our water demands. Just uh, back of the envelope calculations, I think uh, reusing 80% of our estimated uh, you know, wastewater, uh, that would sort of make us 75% of our uh, you know, industrial water demand or 20% of our power sector requirement right now. So I think that is a that is the sort of a, you know volume which is potential is there you know in this sector right now. Uh, this can also sort of you know play a paradigm shift in terms of you know it increases the water resilience because relying on sewage more is a very dependable source of you know, uh, raw water, so which can be treated and even reused. So this plus it will free up the you know fresh water resources for other uses or for you know fostering economic uh, ecological flow. So which will sort of you know in a way you know, mitigate the impacts of climate change. So apart from the environmental benefits, I think it, it's also a sustainable source of revenue uh, uh, for uh, the US business which is currently cashed up. They have very few sources of you know generating income, you know, for them. Uh, investing and maintaining such infrastructure is critical and you know a, a, a source of revenue can can go a long way in, in terms of this, uh, this thing. So uh, I think for another Foremost challenge in this scenario is the ability to, ability to perceive and accept two, two facts. One, that for water is a finite resource. And second, that what, wastewater is an economic asset. You know, I think once we sort of embed this in our, you know, uh, sort of our working or culture, you know, uh, this thing, I think a um, lot of things will streamline you know, down, down the line, you know, stream, downstream. Because if we work with this mindset, then I think we can achieve a lot of you know, other, we can overcome other challenges, you know, because we, we start working you know. So, uh, also, uh, you know, we must take into account the stringent water quality required for power and, you know, uh, industries, uh, the, actually the, you know, poor, poor applications of this, uh, this thing. So, the, the STP operator, I mean, the assurance of both quality and quantity of that, you know, uh, water is essential for that security. So this again, I mean, this needs to be supported by a regulatory in a way. There's a payback mechanism. There is a you know, um, a short payback and buyback of that uh, this thing. So uh, another issue is that you know uh, the geographic locations of 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 may, some, if not many, uh, power plants and industries are, are away from the uh, you know major settlements. You know where the wastewater is. Is, is generated. So, the cost of transportation of treated wastewater along long distances that is a financially challenging and you know, complicated, uh, you know, uh, task. Uh, so that is something you know we we can't do it with like a hundred percent uh, application of these uh, this solution to everywhere. But maybe you know wherever possible we should do it. Uh, one crucial aspect is the extreme tariff of fresh water for industries. 
So I think in most states the the rates are between 20 to 40 rupees per kvd for industrial water. And only few states like you know which are already sort of water states like Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu they charge between you know around 100 rupees per kvd. <coughs> so I think that is that is one I think one of the major impediments. I mean when we see that you know um, you know for uh, how. So I mean that's for economic viability, I think that's one of the critical factors of that. So uh, similarly the funding is a significant issue, uh, you know, who, the question is who will shoulder the initial costs of the investment and how it will be, you know, sort of recovered, you know, in terms of, uh, for instance, the power sector can, you know, transfer it as a user charge, but it is difficult in terms of industrial applications when you see you good for industries. This, I think, uh, just a broad, uh, you know, treatment cost. Uh, of different uh, levels of treatment, but I think you are much more aware of this, so I will not discuss this further. But I just want to emphasize that you know, it's a fit for use strategy, you know, where a high level of treatments is not required for so you know, maybe when so if we know the end review, I mean, the end purpose of that reuse, you know, so maybe if you are just using cooling power, you know, cooling plants, so we don't have to uh, deal it to a very that level, you know, where it's uh, RO plus DM sort of thing. And similarly, if you're using for horticulture, then we don't need to treat it for that level. So we can sort of optimize the cost for reuse and you know uh, treatment cost if we know the end purpose of that uh, uh, this thing, of, the, of the, the water. So in summary, I think we must uh, I think enhance our efforts to improve the interception and diversion, and you know, uh, you know ramp up the treatment capacities. Uh, also, I think we already you know we need to revise our freshwater tariffs and you know implement a fit for use. One of the key aspects I think I would like to take was the role of private sector and you know PPP. So I think robust project structure in you know where you know the risks are shared, the responsibilities are you know divided. Um, you know I think there, there's a lot of funds available in terms of you know green funds, you know bonds, carbon you know uh, markets, you know carbon pricing is there right now. I mean speaking of with a lot of uh, focus is there. So a lot of sustainability funds are there and you know if the project is structured well, I think there is enough finance available in the market. So I think that is where um, I think I will end up. So I will wrap up my presentation. I will uh, uh, invite my first Good afternoon everyone, thanks to CE for giving this opportunity, very interesting sessions, All the, the, I, unfortunately I wasn't here for the first half but then I went to the agenda and it seemed very interesting, very good discussions. Thankfully I was part of the national policy framework on reuse of safe reuse of treated water. And thanks Mr. Jain for setting the stage. There were three professionals, Jeremy Bird, who was the Director General of uh, IFMI, Krishna Chaitanya Rao and myself, who drafted the, co-drafted the SRTW, as we call it, safe reuse of treated water, not waste water, yeah, it is water policy framework of India. It was basically it set the stage for states as in uh, the previous presentation Mr. Jain had shown. Several states have their state policies on SRTW but they are quite, some of them are very good, some of them are quite disjointed and some of them are part of the water policy of the state. So there was a need, as mentioned by Mr. Mishra Pukilinga in MCG, to bring out a uniform SRTW policy framework, and this framework has set the stage for a template for other states. So I'm glad that I was part of this process. After that, we were again hired by NMCG and 
GIZ, this was under GIZ funding and the India EU Water Partnership. As a second phase of this, this is support to Ganga rejuvenation. We were taken hired for the same team for implementation of this because we know in India we are very good at policies. We prepare the best of policies from the best of the different countries. But when it comes to implementation, there is a huge challenge. Challenge maybe because of the intent, because of the very conditions in different states and even within the national government because several ministries interests are aligned in the same thing. So there is overlapping and the purpose gets defeated. So we have tried to bring in this uniformity in the national SRTW policy. So to begin with, we don't look at used water or waste water as a burden. It's a resource. It's a valuable resource. So henceforth, we will be talking it, calling it as used water. And the basic premises are like the principles of reducing, recovering, reusing. We know six R's like rejuvenation, repurposing, redesigning. But the, the pillars are this. So with this, we prepared this policy in 2020. 2021, it was ready, but it was launched in 2023 by the Honorable Prime Minister of India with the vision of safe reuse in India, which reduces pressure on fresh water, it curbs environmental pollution, minimizes health risks, and fosters socio-economic gains through a sustainable circular economy approach. So, SRTW. It, we are basically, it is a signal to shift away from waste and take it as a resource and it is not a liability but a blessing so that it can see several cycles of reuse and repurpose. It captures the focus on safe reuse that is fit for purpose. We also propose in this policy to call it Apnajal because there has to be ownership. We have seen where there is ownership of purpose, of need, there is more public acceptance. We have said no to two things. I may slightly differ from you here. One is non-portable purpose only because portable water is scarce. We have to conserve portable water so that and this water can replace purposes like washing, cleaning, horticulture, agriculture to a level where it is not directly connect, connecting to the edible crops. Groundwater is something which we have to be very careful about because we have to exercise the principle of very, very cautious we have to be with groundwater recharge. If we do a small mistake, it's going to pollute the entire aquifer. We have seen this in the past, so we, that's no, no. Potable water is a no, no. Singapore has, new water has been pioneered in the world, yet they are facing issues of water for potable purpose. It is not the water quality that sticks in our brain, but the history of water that sticks in our So the changing of mindset is not that easy. Yeah, from where all the water has come, where all it has been, no matter how much we have treated, but the history is more important than quality for us. Not just us in India, but generally that is. Unless you have that much of credible utility, like the Singapore, where penalty is very high, compliances are very high. Otherwise, it's not easy to match that kind of mindset change. So the drivers of SRTW have been addressing water scarcity and multiple. This is a very 
very well talked about map. I will not go into the details, but the, the red in this also is a red signal to us that we really need to buckle up. Otherwise, we are going heading fast to the Cape Town incident. Several of our stakeholders, cities have nearly touched there, but then we have to take ourselves out of this crisis situation. This is the water project uh, demand uh, projections. So 2025, we are almost there. The total water demand is 1093, and we are heading towards 1500 soon in the next 25 years. So the circular economy principles and reuse, which provides revenue streams for reuse water treatment, it is complementary to recovery of nutrients. It reduces use of several fertilizers. This is a waste flow diagram where we are seeing how the waste flow, be it excreta, detergents, organic residues, animal, animal manure, other residues, for example, oil, soil, litter, etc., and which can be used, reuse purposes, which can be finding multiple reuse purposes. We have in this SRTW policy, we have strictly not taken industrial wastewater because it cannot be used for agriculture or other purposes. On the other hand, Municipal sectors, sewage water can be used for agricultural purposes. And that's what Surat has been doing, that's what Chennai Metro has been doing and serving. Because if it is used for industrial purposes, I will show you my business model diagram which is in the next few slides, how it is tenable for industrial purpose but not tenable for some of the purposes because financial tenability and viability is the crux of SRTW. So the objective has been to move India on a pathway of mainstreaming SRTW by encouraging states to adopt the necessary enabling environment and actively promoting its implementation. And we are also contributing to SDG 6.3. We are contributing to climate mitigation. We are also supporting initiatives in river basin planning. So it covers, as I said, non-portable uses and it's a mandate for the reuse of treated use water. Some of the states have done extremely well, some of the states are still struggling, some of the states are non-starters. So this model framework for states puts things in order in their own policy, regulatory and implementation instruments. This diagram shows the purple purple arrows basically shows the used water where it can be used and this is how the circularity the used water domain works cpcb has been working in parallel on it has also come out with the policy on treated industrial waste water i will not dwell into that so our this policy has taken care of national environment policy, national urban sanitation policy, fecal sludge and septage policy, general children machine, amrut, etc. So the potential areas are industry, agriculture, agriculture, municipal uses, on-site of STP, environmental, construction industry is booming and there's, there are big takers and aquifer recharge only in case of places where the compliance is very high. Unfortunately, we have, as a country, India has not evolved to that level now. We have put some milestones. As I mentioned, some states have done extremely well. For those states where the collection and treatment capacity already exists, aim for 50% by 2025 and 100% reuse by 2030. It is aligning with the SDG goals. And where collection and treatment cap capacity doesn't exist, so we have put this mandate of 30% reuse by 2030, 50% by 2035, and 100% by 2045. The way it is going, I think we should be able to at least achieve the 2030 and 2035.
milestone and hopefully the 100% milestone would be sooner than 2045. So additional targets for individual STPs can be set so that there is 50% reuse after establishing STP and 100% reuse after 10, within 10 years. The outcomes as I mentioned, water security is one of the mains, health benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits, economic benefits, innovation and more efficient technology, increased capacity in ULBs and reduced climate emissions. Uh, I will not go into the details of each because I would like to share with you the, um, the business model which we have developed for this. So this is basically something which I have already mentioned. We have to follow a risk-based approach and fit for purpose. We have been talking about contaminants of emerging concern. So several STPs are not equipped to treat wastewater to that level where it, it is able to do, do away with the contaminants of emerging contaminants uh, con uh, of emerging concern CECs. I'll come to that separately. So the concept here is this, where the used water available, treatment requires and the available technologies have to be seen and optimized to the treatment technology available and the used water uptakes. So the demand and supply are very important and the challenge is to find solution with lowest cost benefit ratio. This is what is the increasing cost recovery for irrigation, secondary treatment is enough, restricted urban reuse, tertiary filtration and industrial non-potable reuse tertiary membrane filtration and uh, for nitrogen and phosphorus controlled direct potable reuse and direct potable or high quality process for RO and disinfection. So the cost is also very important. Our premise is we will treat water to secondary level and the industry could buy it at their own cost so that they will bear the cost of the tertiary treatment. Several Challenges like public perception, viability, financing, compliance, integration and coordination and managing the transition are big challenges. Surat is a wonderful example. They are earning 150 crores per annum and it covers a lot of their ULB costs. I'll be to Surat myself. We have also developed a business model company where Surat, Chennai, Aurangabad, Delhi Airport, IOCL are some of the examples, best practices in India which have been covered along with four good practices from Spain, Germany, Italy which are there in the company. I think it will be coming out anytime soon in the next couple of months. So Surat has 11 STPs with total capacity of 1173 1, MLD capacity and is augmenting those with another six STPs to provide a total plant capacity of 1,600 plus MLDs. By 2021, SMC has managed to provide 40% of reuse of treated water and it has a sewer length of nearly 2,000 kilometers which covers over 99% population. So the trend of increased population and industrialization is putting a lot of pressure Still, they are able to manage it very well because of the thought out plans. Gujarat's policy or use is commendable in that regard. The business model of Surat is this if you see, SMC, the fresh water comes to the household and the used water goes to the STPs, and secondary used water goes to the tertiary treatment plant and Pandasera Industrial Estate GIDC. GPCB is closely monitoring, like all the state pollution control boards, it's closely monitoring the quality and it is basically working very well. Since industries are the main buyers, it has cash, which is cash surplus. We will see in the case of Panipat how it is. So the learnings from this model is, it is adapted, uh, adopted in other ULBs in Gujarat, but it has actually not been adopted that fast. The structure, approach of identifying availability, demand, and uh, agreement for supply coupled with 
availability of capex funds and ability to meet OPEX cost as well as generating profit for the sale of SRTW led to rapid uptake of treated water. This success has reduced the dependency of fresh water and water from Tapu River and reduction in surface and groundwater abstraction has been seen. Most ULBs in India are struggling for funds, but ULB in Surat is doing extremely well. We have this Panipat case study, we asked the NMCG to take up Panipat as a case study. We collected data, analyzed, we visited several times, took KPIs, key person interviews, stakeholder consultations, and developed three types of models, that is industry, agriculture, and urban for the financial modeling template. So Panipat has basically these eight uh, uh, STPs and we have mapped the, because you know, laying of pipeline is going to be very expensive and very inefficient because our non-revenue water is very high. So we have mapped the takers in different zones, such as 29 is for industries. Similarly, there are some agriculture, some agriculture paths where the Jetal Road would work very well. Some of the, the ones like Seva are very close to the industrial units. Similarly, Sector 19 STP is close to some of the urban colonies. So Sector 19 and Sector 6 in Panipat have been closed for, have been close to the urban settlements for use for urban users. Uh, Cost of RO is very, very high compared to ultrafiltration. We have seen that ultrafiltration is a very effective way. Not as effective and efficient, I shouldn't say the efficient word for RO. Not as effective as RO, but definitely almost there. And cost-wise, it is quite, quite competitive. So we have proposed and it's recommended to the government that ultra filtration to be taken because RO itself is water wasting because it consumes nine cycles of water when we are taking one cycle of water for the purposes. And pumping conveyance cost is very high, pipeline cost is very high. So keeping all this in mind, ultra violet is the UV, uh, um, ultra filtration is the best remedy for this. This is the industrial reuse. You will see that business model where from household it is going to STPs, PHEP is basically the supplier of water. There are some, uh, some of these uh, single operators who are very efficiently managing. The tertiary treatment, after tertiary treatment, these private agencies are again sending this water and which is being uh, monitored by pollution control board. Some of the clusters which have textiles has to be very, very mindful about the TDS because when the TDS is high, the, the, the needle gets choked and then it, it, it's not able to take that water. So Panipat has, this textile sector has this very big challenge. And it is very viable. Similarly for agriculture, we had two models. One was the, this is the water swap model, where the STPs send it to the Haryana Education <laughs> Department to the farmers. and the farmers get benefited, the farmers are not able to pay much. It's very, very nominal or for many places it is no cost also. The other one is the entrepreneur model, where the entrepreneur takes the crux of this cost and he delivers water, supplies water as needed. The third one, sorry, the third one is this urban model where we see that urban model is not that cost efficient but it can be clubbed with either agriculture or the industry in order to be in order to be effective. Because urban settlements are clustered here and there, it's not that cluster, and they have been using water tankers, which is again having climate emissions, carbon emissions, etc. So the best option is the uh, industry, second is the agriculture, third one, which can be combined with either agriculture or uh, industry is the urban one. This is the viability. We have done, done the NPV and IRR for PhD, uh, this PhDs. 
and this is how it is for IOCL RO and IOCL ultra filtration. This is the cost, which is quite you can you can see how it is feasible. For textile cluster reverse osmosis, the price of water is rupees six per kiloliter, and for tertiary treated water is rupees thirty five kiloliter, and uh, it is it is able to meet the cost. Whereas ultra filtration, the cost is you see is very less. It is six hundred and fifty four lakhs for it is fourteen percent. So ultra filtration has a higher chance and higher take. Uh, I am not going to the details of it. This I have already mentioned the OPEX cost recovery is feasible and revenue generated for the urban if it is clubbed with agriculture or industry. These are some of the findings. We have also recommended there should be no fresh water zone so that water is not extracted because brown water is free and then if then if we have to see that as RTW buyers are there, you have to have very strong legislation in place. Otherwise, it is going to be a non-starter. These are the recommendations which I have already men mentioned. Groundwater abstraction should be illegal. Yeah. So this is uh, you can scan it for the PDF, and there is also a YouTube video on this. We have been funded by several organizations, and we do a lot of studies on emerging contaminants, plastic pollution, hazardous chemicals, etc. Thank you. Thanks to Council of Environment Place for giving me this opportunity to present uh, findings on wastewater management and zero liquid discharge. Good evening to senior delegates here and uh, my colleagues and participants here. I would directly go to some of the slides I think it has been presented by the previous presenters. Uh, we have uh, taken this source out of uh, world resources uh, institutions. Uh, we have shown only the current scenario for India only. But if we see the global uh, stages, as per technology is concerned, though we are in the highest stress level, almost 80 part of the India is at the higher water stress level. But we are far uh, away from the technology upgradation. So, where uh, if we go to the United States and uh, other countries, Western countries, they are very advanced to upgrade the technology. And see, uh, they are not very much uh, affected by this water stress and all, but still they are aware of. Why? Because this uh, atlas provides them the opportunity to invest to get the market to other countries. Now, uh, I would say that why we need for uh, wastewater management? The rising population, rapid economic growth, climate change, triggering uh, enormous water uh, availability challenges worldwide. <coughs> Second, if you go, the natural water crisis among the top 10 risk to humanity is for the global economic 2020. 36% of the global pop, uh, populations live in area of high water scarcity, which could rise up to over 50% by 2050. The result has been, you know, different have variations by previous potential also. In India, water requirement by 2050 in high use scenario is likely to be at 1180 million cubic meter, whereas the present key day availability of surface water is 695. Now comes to the limitations uh, posed by the government of India uh, with their different regulatory policies. We have seen uh, from 5 meter cube per megawatt hour to 3.5 then 3. Now we are talking about 2.5. In previous slides, we have seen up to 3 cubic meter per megawatt hour. But what I would say and what I have referred is 2.5, but with zero liquid discharge concept. See some uh, major patterns of uh, utilizing the water uh, in the power plant. 
cooling water purpose, there is a clarifier maker, the DM water maker, potable water, service water. In note, I have mentioned some of the packages where water cannot be uh, feed as a makeup water, it has to be reused or recycled. Some major packages are ash handling, flue gas discharge, horticulture, CHP dust separation, floor washing, and other purposes also. The distribution, the major distribution is something like that. Cooling uh, tower makeup is the major consumer of the makeup water, the plant water system. Here is the scenario of distributions. Somewhere around 85 percent. The data which I have shown is uh, typical for 660 megawatt, two units. 85 percent we are feeding as a cooling tower makeup. <coughs> Comes to the source of wastewater. Wastewater source majorly in power plant, which are normally being uh, accounted by or any 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 person can on fingertips say that these are the cooling tower blow down, clarifier slash DM vegetation, boiler blow down, potable wastewater, service water. And now, nowadays, FGD wastewater also is there. This is the some of the distributions of uh, uh, generation of wastewater. Major still you can see the cooling water systems. This is the distributions. Almost 56.4% of the wastewater is being generated from the cooling uh, tower blowdown. Next come to different uh, distributions like boiler blowdown is there, plain by slide is there. It has been shared by previous uh, presenter also. This is the basic uh, water balance diagram. Achha, uh, Mr. Bhatnagar, uh, this is the, uh, basically a typical uh, uh, water balance diagram. Mr. Bhatnagar has mentioned that uh, real time water balance diagram. This is the water balance diagram. Normally, when we propose some projects to environment clearance or from design basis report or detailed project report, normally we used to refer this one, giving some figures like that that uh, we are making uh, zero liquid discharge by this concept. Earlier, FGT makeup was not there, and uh, now FGT makeup also <coughs> has been introduced in this. This is stages of water treatment and uh, if we generation say uh, this is a pre-treatment uh, case where uh, raw water is directly converted to clarified water with uh, different uh, conventional scenario of water treatment. It will directly go to uh, cascade aerator, distilling chamber, partial fume, flash mixture, then it comes to the settling chamber or clarifier, then it has been collected as a gentleman water. From here, the distribution goes to different uh, users like uh, CW Rodon. Here you can see that DM water is the only water which needs extra treatment. Other waters are directly here. Potable water also needs some process and filtration, then becomes a potable water. Other are uh, almost clarified water users. This is the human water treatment scheme. How we treat the water? Normal Conventional scheme, if you see, the water directly from the CW blowdown can be directly go to the ash handling for the makeup purpose. Now, almost 462 cubic meter of water, we are directly uh, giving as a makeup for a FGD system. Here in the centralized monitoring system, where from all the uh, sources of the water is being collected after some uh, pre-treatment, mostly a tube settler for removal of the suspended solids and uh, uh, pH neutralization then comes to the central monitoring basis, then it uh, goes to the reactor clarifier where uh, further uh, treatments being given for removal of the suspended solids, then clear water is being collected for further use. This is the reuse scheme basically, somehow. Uh, service water and that separation purpose we use to get some of the water from here and some of the water from here. Next come to the approach for wastewater treatment. This is the approach basically how we are, uh, how do we conceptualize the wastewater uh, management. There are some steps like analysis of the process. See, we have, uh, as I uh, have in, shown you in the slide, we have uh, different uses in the power plant, like uh, DM water system is there, cooling water system is there, the service water system is there. So each and every system, one by one, has to be analyzed for wastewater uh, chemistry. What 
putting the wastewater chemistry and uh, how uh, the quantifications of uh, those wastewater is being uh, measured. Then it comes to the pollution prevention programs. See, pollution prevention programs basically, uh, if, if it is a proactive approach or uh, it is guided by the policies. The major uh, purpose is to minimize the total water wastage, then uh, toxicity of wastewater. And this can be achieved. There are uh, substitutions of non-toxic substances for toxic substances. See, uh, normally for disinfection we use uh, chlorine dosing uh, to disinfect the water. But in current scenario, there are two options, ozone and ultraviolet filtration also is there. Ultraviolet treatment also is there. For ozone, it is very effective, but the main disadvantage is that it needs very careful control and monitoring. Because excess of the ozone, because ozone is very highly oxidizing, highly reactive and oxidizing in it. If, if being not controlled properly, it will create that corrosion in the pipe. So we need extra precautions to while using the ozone. For ultraviolet uh, treatment, it is nothing but uh, it will uh, simply uh, alter the DNA of the bacteria. The bacteria will not propagate or uh, expand in that and it's not, uh, if it's being utilized, it can be utilized without any further treatment. For chlorine, uh, definitely chlorine, chlorine needs a lot of uh, uh, attention to monitor and further if it goes to the wastewater discharge, it needs further treatment and before disposal or reuse. Then come up to the second option is the changing the process or equipment. As uh, previous slides also it has been shared by other speakers that uh, air cool condenser in case of uh, conventional uh, water cool condenser, it is a good one. Second thing is that we have to monitor the equipments which are having major leakages. Like, uh, major rotary equipment like sea water is there. So that replacement has to be done and uh, while operation uh, maintenance staff has to keep quite uh, close vigilance on that to avoid these leakages. Second, uh, recycle and reuse. Ash water recovery is there. As uh, mentioned, 70% mostly of the ash water is being recovered for reuse. Then uh, city blowdown also can be used as a makeup for LGD as handling I have shown. That's why I have not mentioned uh, there in the uh, scheme for water consumption. Then wastewater audit. Wastewater audit basically is a very important part and mentioned by previous uh, slides also. Uh, it basically uh, gives us the access and usage of waste uh, wastes to work opportunity for improvement and minimization of waste. Wastewater characterization and minimization. This is the first opportunity. Wastewater treatment system depends on the wastewater characterization in relation to the regulatory requirement for discharge from the plant. Characterization is basically why we need to uh, characterize based on the chemistry of the wastewater. Regulatory guidelines say that there are limitations on TDS, TSS, UD, BOD. Some uh, limited parameters are there. So we have to uh, characterize first what we are going to discharge or what we are going to treat. Then next thing, it provides us the uh, complete information for the designing the treatment system and sizing of the equipments for the system. Wastewater characterization, for wastewater characterization, mainly if you see most of the regulatory norms or environment norms says TSS, TDS, UD, BOD, PH. Beyond that, there is a turbidity, oily waste, heavy metal hardness. This is always missed from those uh, norms. If you see environmental uh, regulation also, this right side four parameters, you can't see that. And uh, this also basically now, uh, if we uh, don't uh, monitor this also, maybe uh, suppose I have an example. See, uh, we tap water from the river. And uh, when we discharging to the river again after minor treatment and so, and we say that we follow the environment uh, guidelines only, 
and we'll monitor only TSS, TDS, UD, UD, and TH. We'll not monitor community oil wells, heavy metal, and artists. Then, downstream of the water resource, the IPP, which is going to use that water, will hire terminality oil wells, heavy metal, and artists. That burden comes to him. That cost will go to the next user of that. So this is this also I I in my opinion I believe that these four parameters also has to be mentioned in the uh, regulations. Next is the treatment objective. Treatment objectives why we need to treat the water. What is the purpose? It is recycle, reuse, or uh, reduce. Reduce it definitely we have to optimize it. Based on that purpose we have to select a technology. What technology we are going to adopt? Then. Cost analysis. See, for similar treatment, we have multiple technologies. We have to work out what will be the capex and opex for that technology. Then, wisely and judicially, we have to select a technology. Then, final designs. These are the flow to do the wastewater treatment, wastewater management. Then, this is one of the audit point of I have taken this uh, for uh, DM cycle. Why doing the audit? Why we have, you know, uh, as I told that parameter I have shown you while taking the environment clearance and preparing the DPR to get the budget for the project. But when it, it comes to the actual, our uh, quantity will increase. Why this is increasing? Why we need to monitor all these things? And what are things? Uh, what are the things or the bigger uh, a source of, uh, you know, extra quantity of beer water is required? So, th there are some parameters like equipment, vacuum pump overflow is there. We have to keep the close monitoring of the operating parameters. So, some method also has been given. This is the one of the like uh, 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 steam water sample analysis. Normally, I have seen the people used to uh, leave the, the cooler just like that, the water keep on flowing. That is also a deep water only. If you have taken the sample, you ensure that water, even single drop of the water should not go get, get out of the stream. Personally, while doing the performance guarantee test while working in BHL, I collected almost 2-3 uh, liters of the water within a minutes from the uh, highly qualified uh, sea walls. So that was, that was basically, you see, uh, we we give uh, some tolerance. This tolerance has to be either reduced or has to be eliminated. Otherwise, people used to work on those tolerance. And definitely the practice will go in vain. Our motive will go will fail. These are some methods basically, basic methods, the chemical, physical and biological methods to treat the water, waste water. This is the, as I told you, this is the effluent water quality. You see the thermal power plant. Condenser cooling water, we have given only three parameters. pH, temperature, free, available, chlorides. That's all. We have biological. We have other TDS. Where is that? TDS major. It's missing. And down the line, suppose, by default, anybody throw this water in the river or in the surface water, and that water is going to be utilized for irrigation purpose or drinking, uh, drinking uh, purpose. These are the guidelines. You see, this is the guideline CPCB and BIS 1982. That's like, this is total dissolved solids. If you see, E, this is the irrigation industrial cooling controlled wastewater disposal. If you don't maintain the TDS, like uh, in our system also, is there. We reject it to the surface water. Are, are these, uh, I mean, this quality is going to be acceptable for irrigation purpose? In my opinion, all these parameters has to be included in this one. With these four parameters, water quality and uh, discharge quality cannot be controlled. So these are the some uh, basic treatment which is which based on the feasibility study, technology selections, and uh, if the cost per bit can be selected. 
If you don't go for any technology adoption, you will think you simply blend it. Only for that. You blend it. You use it for MGD, you use it for ash handling. There is no extra treatment is required. You can directly use it. Short term ponding also can be done. You can uh, save the water for soft or short term. The major thing is that uh, you need some dilution, you need some space to store it. Further treatment philosophy can be discussed after this short term ponding. What we are going to do with this water? That is why short term ponding. Here, motive is not defined. Evaporation ponding is there. You leave it in a uh, uh, large <coughs> reservoir, let it get evaporated. Rover's formula is there. 1.2 cubic meter per hour per acre. You select the quantity, you select the area, let it go, you have to get evaporated and you lost it. RO regeneration, high and medium pressure regeneration is there. Yes. If you are with the government norms, you select it. And B part to reduce the pollution. Let's come to the DMG. DMG regeneration. Neutralize it in printing. Nothing to do. Simply control the pH and use it. Blending with other wastewater. Good for small regeneration to use. Short term ponding as I told you. Collect it, maintain the pH and later on decide what to do with this water. Solar ponding is there. You leave it and get it evaporated automatically. And evaporation is not uh, good because, see, evaporation is something like this. Evaporation, solar ponding is also same, the same purpose. You are going to lose the water to environment and the vapor. Boiler flow down also is there. So, some pattern is almost same. What we are going to decide, pattern is almost same. This is here also. Here are some parameters we have written that TDS, TSS, what are the characteristics? Different characteristics, but well. Now next thing comes here is interesting thing. Vapor, uh, compression, evaporation, crystallization, these are two important which has already been mentioned here. Vapor, uh, compression, evaporation is the technique where you can collect the pure water. You need not to go for the RO. You can collect the pure water. As we know, water in a vapor form is the purest water. So this water also can be collected. But the thing is that to evaporate this water, what, what will be the source of heat? Either you go for electric. So let me go to go past. This is the proposal actually we have given in one of the project how we are going to utilize this. This is the reuse of the water. Clarified sludge we are directly treating. Almost 80% uh, we are using back to the clarifier. Balance we are sending into the clarifier sludge. The boiler roller 98% quantitative CT mega for ash handling. Cooling tower 462 we are sending into FGD, 92 we are sending into uh, ash handling. This is the latest technology, as I said. A clarifier uh, due to gravity settlement, if uh, it requires a lot of uh, space, area. But if you go for this hydrocyclone separator, it works same thing. It reduces your, uh, remove the uh, total suspended solids. The best thing is that it requires less space. We are discussing about water, but we are also having scarcity of land also. If you introduce this hydrocyclone separator, the rate is very high and you will get the same result. And best thing is that one of the waste water will reduce. You don't go for the backwash in this condition. Backwash is not required. This is a new technology. This continuous deflection separator. This is for uh, clarification of uh, uh, runoff water. This is the latest technology. The rock water can be, there are three conditions. Oily waste is there, will be there, suspended solids will be there and water will be there. This blend will be removed in three stages. First one, the oil and everything will be removed due to lower uh, density. It will be removed from the top layer. Where is the water and suspended solid will get settled down. This is the latest technology. The cost also in the industrial market is uh, 5,000 to 50,000 US dollars based on the capacity. 
now we select the membrane ultra this is uh, ultra filtration you have to go nano filtration you have to go or auto you have to go this depends on the clarity and uh, the tds level and what we want exactly in the water these are different separation levels cooling tower blow down everybody has explained very really well and most of the topics uh, covered this so cuc i would like to say cuc is something which is uh, in, in a general term we use cuc cuc basically is suppose you have it cuc is totally depends on raw water intake what is the tds level see uh, as per the international guideline says if you maintain cuc up to 1000 to 1200 tds level ppm your uh, condenser efficiency will not be lost if you go beyond that your condenser tube will start choking it so saying that cuc 5 and 6 always saying cuc 5 and 6 not correct it depends the source of raw water where from you are taking if raw water you are taking from the river or some reservoir where tds level is 200 to 250 5 to 6 okay if you are getting raw water with a tds value of 300 400 it is not correct to go for 5 and 6 uc your tube will get choked your heat rate will get uh, defeated and eventually what you have to do we have to uh, burn more and more coal your plant efficiency will go down other factors will get disturbed so saying uc 5 and 6 is not a correct term use tds 1000 to 1200 maintain the tds level to that level cuc but let, let the cuc comes to 3.5 We have to see the the router. What is the router needs? Then only that it has to be done. Let's use it. This is the basic. Basically, this chart has to be seen. You see, four between four to six, the activity is basically directly it is related to TDS. This is an international. I have shown this from one of the international papers where TDS uh, they have uh, multiplied with some of the factor. So 2,400, 3,600. If you go in line to that, four to six TDS, they are referring as per this table. Water quality has to be at a day level with this TDS. These are some of the parameters which uh, our seniors also has mentioned. What treatment they are giving to the uh, cooling tower blow down before sending it to. The, they have to decide. It has to be reused or it has to be disposed. If we have to be reuse or recycle, they have to go for RO, iron shake, and softening with chemical cooling. Then comes to the LGD. I believe I have short of time. So LGD is basically the one thing is that I have saw this from one of the paper I have on this. I have shown this on electricity, electric utility in India safety manual, volume one, electricity process design, March 1996. It has been prepared by Indian International LLC, Austin, Texas, for U.S. Department of Energy. 1996. They were in the shape to design FGD and gave us what exactly the water requirement. And we are in the conceptualization stage. And as I show, we are under. high water stress level and still we are in conceptualization so the thing is that my perception is that i believe we have to uh, uh, do some revolutionary steps to meet them this is basically uh, one of my project 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 <laughs> where water requirements for ngd is 300 to 400 cubic meter per hour we have 200 uh, 20 exhaust as a waste water and is directly being utilized for uh, high concentrations of disposal this water also can be this water also can be utilized if we put the ro system and uh, recover it this is the basic uh, design prepared by the rebuild 1996 this is basic concept for fgd The thing is that the mega water here C C W T B I have T B D I have mentioned 
this total be, uh, water is being recovered. Blue down is required when your TDS level uh, shoots uh, permissible limits. Here the key process variables also we have mentioned when we have to go give the what will be the liquid to gas ratio. We have limitation from the water consumption flow. We have to calculate. We have to cap the liquid to uh, gas ratio also. Normally 80 percent of because uh, once you have had the LGD, LGD requires a wet chain. So almost 70 percent of the water get evaporated. So we have to keep on uh, feeding them. Motivations for the uh, geologic condition is for water scarcity, water economics, here, environment conditions <coughs> are there. Benefit definitely everybody knows that and presented by my previous uh, speakers also. There are two processes if you follow the GLD. There is a thermal process where evaporation and crystallization is there. You cannot gain water from this phase. But Rest 2, 3, 4, 5, you can recover the water. This is the volume reduction process. You use any of these process, you can recover the water. <coughs> this is a, a simple uh, zero liquid discharge scheme. You have to do uh, lines of the, to do, to do the hardness, filtration is there, any suspended solid is there, then carter filter, any fine filtration is required, go for reverse osmosis. And you get the TDS removed, evaporator is there. You can directly use the clean water and uh, whatever reject is there along with the high TDS, utilize the evaporator for the recover the water and finally leave the dry salt. The dry salt also is nothing but a solid waste. And uh, there is no policy has been formed or framed or drafted for this disposal. The salt which has been disposed after Argo, where it is going to be disposed. One of the colleagues of mine is working on this. He salt from this reject can be utilized to produce detergent. Nirma normally use that salt. Nirma is already recovering that salt and using it in their detergent. The salt also has to be very carefully stored and it cannot be disposed to anywhere. Because it also is going to be uh, heat of the land, the land will get battered. So another uh, challenge is there is waste disposal of solids. This is one of the key where water after uh, utilizing and cooling the water flow down, I have mentioned here, you can see the first stage of uh, RO, then you can go to the further, it depends on the requirement. If you want to uh, reduce the TDS to service water level, you opt first phase. But if you want to go for deep water regeneration, deep water utilization, even you add four phase. Here, electrode ionization is required. This is optional. If you can opt, otherwise you can simply go for the RO. There are two stage. Stage one, recovery to TGS for the water quality up to service water level. And further, if you want to go for the deep water level, you can use another phase of the RO. So this is a phase uh, additions. And further rejects can be utilized after filtration, it can be ascended to the fire. This is a simple RO scheme which I mentioned. The suspension, the filtration, and the hardness removal is there, and the removal of the TDS is there. One more thing, you see, uh, water balance we have mentioned everything, but uh, the major type of water will get lost from the reservoir evaporations. Now, uh, government has come up with the uh, floating solar. One of my colleagues is working in the uh, Amar Kantak solar plant. I mean, he has got the contract to execute that plant to install floating solar. Floating solar is a very good concept to avoid reservoir evaporations. As I told you, 1.2 cubic meter per hour, per acre. If you see the reservoir status, we are losing, losing a huge amount of water in the form of vapor. It can be covered by utilizing this solar uh, ponding and uh, uh, power can be tapped from this place also. So,
cleanliness of this uh, uh, this Kudaradam is being is, is being you know, maintained. So it is only from this particular concept, this uh, this particular aspect of utilizing the human being, as you know, uh, spread across the entire world. So. So to have a, a typical, uh, uh, you know, potential on uh, what is the uh, uh, best of the generality which it can offer for, for the uh, different industries is as we as we go down this kind of inverted uh, triangle. So the uh, the the industry which is at the topmost portion of this triangle has got the highest potential for having a visibility as it comes down the, the kind of industry just which is uh, which is into the <coughs> gas manufacturing or and the gas production it has got a very uh, very increased uh, potential so you can see the uh, the 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 industries of cell of this of the of the EVC uranium cogeneration hot plant they all fall in between the gas sector and the and the kind of textile industry. So we were able to observe that the zero capacity, the potential will vary from approximately five cubic meter per hour to forty cubic meter per hour. And of course, there are many technologies to have the conversion of the unusable liquid frames into a full solid. So these kind of technologies, along with the case studies, it will be explained by my colleague uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Prabhakar and, um, and then uh, we will be there to answer all your questions. Right? Thank you. Good evening, Mark. Uh, thank you, Manu. Uh, so, so, where we are today here, uh, 2024, in 1970 itself, uh, USA was uh, born for this uh, concept of uh, zero liquidity stocks. Uh, as in power plants, our uh, speakers and uh, all colleagues are aware of that, already discussed from morning, what is a um, uh, zero liquidity charge. If in thermal power plants, it is uh, based on the opportunities, we are recycling the water between the boundary of the power plant and utilizing the water and so we are meeting the specific water consumption as per the industrial norms or lesser than that. But when it comes to these kind of industries, we have to uh, look for an opportunity to recover the water from the waste, waste water and the effluent. Because transporting of uh, liquid effluents is very difficult. Uh, also, it cannot be let it out into the any water bodies. So, any industry which is going uh, for uh, easy clearance, they will uh, ask for this uh, provision first. With this only, we can go for uh, further action on the new things. So as Ms. Madhavan explained, uh, we are uh, having a best experience in one of the uh, top <coughs> solar PV cell manufacturer in India now. They are setting up a plant of uh, 4.3 gigawatt. In that, we had a, a specific experience in this uh, ZL, zero liquid discharge, which is handling a lot, uh, which, which is totally entirely new effluents which is generating from the PV cells, uh, and then it has to be treated and it has to be zero liquid discharge, and the water has to be used back into the process. So, uh, the cap which was given by a government, which is more stringent than the so, first I will cover uh, what is ZLD process. Uh, these are the <coughs> major uh, ZLD process available in our uh, boundary now. Uh, major is mechanical vapor compression, thermo vapor, and uh, single effect, multiple effect. AQD and uh, crystallizer, these two are uh, further refining the effluent into salt. <coughs> So the major technologies used in the total process is evaporator. Evaporator is for uh, um, uh, evaporating the water by using a 
boiling point uh, the concentrate the liquid. Drying force is the temperature difference between the inlet and product temperature. So this is uh, one of the uh, mechanical vapor compression uh, with a crystallizer is uh, one technology. Uh, just I will go through the PLT here. Uh, first one is the fluid which is going to the fluid filter and goes for uh, further concentration. Liquid will get concentrated, that is called, uh, we call it as a mechanical vapor compressor. In uh, multiple effect, they call it as a force uh, circulation evaporator. Then it goes for, uh, uh, the vapor will be decompressed and the recirculation will be back. Then the condensate will be comes out from the evaporator, will be condensed and then comes as a crystal. And uh, this discharge as a uh, salt. So these are the eight uh, process involved in this uh, so I go forward because of time constraint. And then this is one, another one is uh, uh, MVR with the centrifuge. Um, the centrifuge is the replacement of crystallizer and ATMP. So ATMP requires further more steam requirement um, apart from centrifuge and uh, uh, centrifuge. So another one is a multiple effect evaporator with the ATMP. This is a photo of that. Here it is the first effect will be a post uh, saturation evaporator uh, which uh, having a main steam on the cell side and the liquid and evaporator uh, vapors will be separated in the separator then it will go on further first, second, third and fourth. So this will be an uh, arrangement of uh, this thing. Uh, we, we can make it as a DVR based also that will be first effect evaporator uh, vapors will be partly into a thermo compressor uh, with a new steam they will uh, compress and use it for uh, uh, reheating the first stage of uh, <coughs> so this is a picture of general D, uh, sorry ATFD uh, anterior thin film dryer which is used in the um, yeah, end of the general D process which makes uh, uh, concentrated lipid into powder form which needs uh, uh, negative draft and also additional steam required. So what is hybrid generally? All speakers are speak about that, volume reduction and other things. Uh, so the hybrid generally is nothing but after effluent treatment plant, there is a effluent which comes XYZ, that will be further treated in the um, pre-treatment kind of uh, UF and RO, further will be reduced and then it goes to thermal generally. So this concept helps now uh, reduce the thermal evaporator loads and capacity. So what is that? That is, uh, um, that is nothing but uh, implementing a pre-treatment followed by a thermal evaporators scheme. <coughs> so that is one is uh, major thing is uh, UF and uh, RO. So some case studies uh, we have done. Some case studies we have done in uh, power plants and also our uh, um, recent experience in uh, solar wind cells. So these are the typical effluents already many speakers have discussed about this uh, uh, type of effluent generated in uh, power plants. Uh, so these are the uh, effluents and uh, this is a uh, effluent generated in PV cells. So if you see the dilute acid sulfuric, high concentrated acid sulfuric, oh, sorry that is a mistake, uh, it is very mistake. That, uh, then uh, one more uh, uh, plant which is coming from the DM plants. DM plant is nothing but here the atrophy water which is 18 mega ohm resistivity at 25 degrees. So that they will use it for uh, uh, PV cells uh, manufacturing. So in this, uh, this is a typical range of uh, uh, worst case scenario we have mentioned uh, of power uh, plant experience. Uh, in this uh, range we are in yellow screen for the power plant. And uh, for the PV cells, we are we will go to red stream uh, in that range uh, that uh, treatment is required. So by implementing the um, energy, uh, by recovering the water from the uh, high recovery treatment, we can reduce 80 percent of the raw water consumption in the uh, power plants. In um, PV cells also we are, whatever gap we are getting from the government, almost 90% we are recovering from the 
solar manufacturing in renewable energy side uh, and use it as a raw material, raw water format. <coughs> so this is a typical scheme of pre-treatment plus uh, thermal ZLD. That we call it as a hybrid uh, ZLD. So this is uh, required actually um, uh, to meet the uh, current environmental norms uh, so we need to look forward of these uh, technologies. Space, of course, there is a requirement of space uh, required for ZLD and uh, storage of salt and other things. Because till now there is no uh, formulated uh, norms for uh, salt disposal. So one typical example of this uh, FGD water before uh, treatment. And uh, by using this thermal ZLD and hybrid, uh, so this is the distillate and the salt formation we achieve. So in India itself, uh, many uh, power plants uh, in future, way forward, they will go for uh, this thermal hybrid energies. Uh, right now, Aspond is there and uh, recirculation is happening. Then uh, if the hybrid of uh, thermal power and renewable power comes into picture, uh, this will uh, require essentially. <coughs> so these are the uh, influence, if you see these uh, TDS levels or uh, chloride levels, which is equal to seawater. We cannot uh, let it out anywhere uh, in that and we cannot recirculate as in the power plant also. So we need to go for this uh, hybrid uh, ZLD schemes and treat the water and further uh, utilize into the system itself. There also we are using for uh, CD makeup only. There also in uh, PV cells also putting our uh, makeup requirement is more uh, same as power plant uh, So uh, because for ultra pure uh, we, we are trying now uh, for ultra pure plant. Uh, uh, we are using 50% of the uh, raw water source and the other 50% is from ZRD water. That means uh, recirculated water from the recycled water from the UTP and ZRD. So, uh, comes to the final thing, uh, there is a key takeaway in uh, related to the power sector. Uh, this is the radius of fresh water consumption of the raw source by recycling the Waters. And uh, particularly for this, this is uh, related to power uh, thermal power plants. This is a requirement, so we need to meet these means We have to go for weather. Uh, some cases we are working on right now for the thermal power plants also. Some of the clients is going for hybrid uh, thermal uh, evaporators and weather uh, this in India. Sir. So, main thing is uh, liquid uh, discharge outside the plant is not allowed. That, that has to be looked at. So, some of the major drivers go for uh, this uh, hybrid uh, ZLD is uh, environmental regulations, as Madhavan mentioned in the uh, 1970s itself. Uh, USA is uh, doing all these things. Now we are concentrating on this. So, any industry which goes for uh, environmental clearance, this is the first uh, document we need to submit. Water scarcity and the water stress uh, is one of the drivers uh, growing uh, globally. So uh, these all already many speakers are told, and uh, also social responsibility we all have. So we need to look into that. Education towards awareness of environmental issues. This is one of the major thing we are doing on CSR activities. Uh, in a year, uh, all companies are doing.
is possible material. This is this is also one of the major problems. Uh, this uh, the hybrid thermal identities, as we have seen in many cases, multiple effect, you know, uh, mechanical work of compression and uh, uh, the final stage, ATFD or slicer, all these things will be decided case to case basis of based on the effluence uh, generation in the so these are the um, key takeaways. The final conclusion is this is promising. Definitely is one of the promising uh, options for uh, water sustainability. Where to acute scarcity of uh, fresh water. Uh, main thing is selection of uh, technology is critical in this case. Should be uh, taken care of uh, before going into uh, right technology. Effluent uh, and also right technology and also based on the availability of source. So in PV cells, uh, units and all, there is no steam. So we can't uh, go for multiple effect operator and uh, followed by ATFT. So there we need to go for a mechanical of compression and uh, initial stage of uh, heater or a small electric boiler, which is non-NGR boiler, has to be taken care of for the initial heat up. Then uh, top up will be made up by the same uh, or electric unit. Then that all depends on the capacity of the plant. If the capacity of the plant, we are working on one only plant. One only thermal generator is a bigger one in, uh, almost uh, in our uh, India. Then uh, 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 this uh, textile and all, even they are not going that much big because they are having a uh, ETP and uh, they are having a nano filtration. Then further, those for remaining only they are getting in the thermal plants, uh, thermal generators. So this uh, one major criteria we need to see and that's Second point is uh, effluent to be identified at the source itself. Uh, and quality and uh, segregation of the effluent which generates from the plant. If the source itself we, we segregate, then we can uh, easily find out the way forward for uh, uh, ZLDs. If the like a uh, effluent which is coming from the uh, cooling tower blown out, it can be treated with a slight infiltration to reduce the uh, TSS. Further it can be used for COC further if the TDS allows, then TDS, then comes for hybrid uh, technology, your forward can be put in that way. Then final remaining effluent can be only mixed with the other stringent effluents and taken for thermal effluent. So that effluent is a source itself, we have to uh, segregate the effluent. That is one major uh, point we need to consider by designing this hybrid technology. So this all mandate to handle, uh, uh, take up the freshwater water resource and the associated discharge uh, uh, effluent amounts. Switzerland and uh, we suggested that they should also have phosphorus treatment and at least there should be monitoring so that the eutrophication of the that is just a, a relatively new lake. Yeah. Phosphorus treatment in secondary treatment stage or tertiary treatment? Secondary stage. Secondary. Tertiary is not a problem. And regarding your question of uh, a cluster where it has been. So when we were doing this exercise, this uh, Panipat case study, so we were recommended highly by NMCG and GIZT to go to Ludhiana and see the cluster where they are having this external cluster and uh, it's just the heavy CTP and it's a very good example but then finally when the final selection of case studies came we were told to go for Chile, Surat and uh, many report here so that's also one cluster. I, I just want to add, whenever they have a kind of industrial zone they give the initial <coughs> Missions to establish it so with some say around eight or nine industries. It should be it should be
be a compulsory bandage that they should have only one brother ADP, one is a So everybody will then fall into this, this line. And then, and then it starts in a kind of work and work. How did you know this come up ad hoc? So there's not so much of planned... Uh, exactly. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
of power plant, going to our global value is more. Uh, next thing about we are talking about this uh, another case study which is uh, uh, PV cells manufacturing compared to these power plants, the value is almost uh, uh, 60 to 40 percent less. Okay, but uh, one thing is reducing of TESS uh, uh, is possible by using a, uh, instead of clarifier, we can go with uh, some uh, filtration, <laughs> uh, stain as self cleaning stain as. But TDS, it should be uh, a conventional hybrid method is RO only. And then after using RO, you have to make the LSA positive. So you have to do some rimming to meet the positive side. Because after RO, it is negative only mostly. That is one point. Yeah, as you said, there are some pilot scale research are going on. We have visited recently with one client, uh, which is uh, <coughs> somewhere in the south, um, leachate uh, water uh, treatment. Okay. Leachate water is a lot of municipal waste which is developed in the STP plants. They are uh, taken to some location for storing the piles kind of thing. From that piles, there is a uh, HDP liner kind of thing is there. From there, they are collecting the leachate. Leachate is highly um, uh, smell and um, water smell and you, you can't see that TDS and all, it's very high. That is one thing. People working on that by using this water to the lambda clarifier and uh, removing some suspended solids, they are putting into their own technology, that box, I don't want to quote the name now. They are uh, splitting the water uh, species into ions <coughs> by doing some uh, radioactive methods. And then they are uh, removing that um, water from that unit, sending to RO and meeting the drinking water standards. Drinking the meeting water standards, ISO 10,000 leachate water.
Any other question? We can take one last question else. We call it a day.